power line with its ancillary rights, we will refer to the ancillary rights here there and the fact that all further conditions will be seen and will uh, is capable of verifying as per that notarial deed. So um, with regards to condition B, okay, or rather the condition relating to the um, uh, the Ribbons and Land Act, or the Ribbons, uh, Roads and Ribbons Act, sorry, um, there we are going to um, quote that condition verbatim. Okay, and as I said, because we don't have that specific um, uh, expropriation notice, we would insert the, those, uh, the expropriation condition as well. But look at, at this particular uh, specifically. We, when we started off, we had A, B, C, and D. Now, now we start off with, uh, with portion one's um, conditions. And we will renumber it as A, even though it was A in the original deed, we will start off with A, and then we will continue to the next condition, and the next condition we know is the right of way. So we're not going to um, insert that because it's not part of my conditions and not part of what I have to bring forward for portion one. So I would continue on to, to the next numbering, okay? So you're not going to now um, basically say, um, uh, instead of uh, uh, the right of way, you're not going to say uh, this is now condition C because in the holding deed it refers to condition C being the expropriation notice. Okay, we're not going to do that because we literally continue with the numbering in our newly created conditions of our title deed, which then goes on to to B, capital letter B, even though in the holding deed it's it's um, condition C, right? And that. Um, uh, as I said to you, for safety's sake, this I would make um, the expropriation condition exactly worded as such as it is in that deed. Uh, um, and then uh, this condition would become C and it would be worded exactly as it appears in the holding deed of 2006. So just again, uh, to, to show you how to qualify this specific portion. One, you cite the, con uh, the, the, um, uh, the property with reference to the farm of uh, pro um, province of KwaZulu, oh well, uh, yeah, Gauteng, of which the property held here under forms a portion. Held here under? How will we know which property is held here under? Well, we are busy with a form R, a form R, uh, which we have, are applying for the issue of form R, which is our certificate of registered title for subdivision. So, because we are applying for this, we, the within mentioned property, this one, which basically says of which the property held here under and it's going to be held by way of that certificate of registered title, forms a part, which property, portion one, is subject to a servitude to convey electricity in favor of ESCOM together with ancillary rights and subject to further conditions as will more fully appear from the notarial deed. That is how you cite, um, uh, with reference to the diagram always, um, you will cite the, or bring forward the condition dealing with ancillary rights affected only um, uh, for purposes of ancillary rights, portion one, okay? Then we now have to consider the uh, qualification um, of, um, uh, of our conditions uh, specifically for portion one. Oh, sorry, for the remaining extent. You can look at um, the wording of, uh, uh, of um, uh, and the notes that are further provided here for purposes of um, drafting of your conditions. Um, but when we get to uh, the remaining extent, as I said, your remaining extent is going to start with the wording exactly as it is um, in your die, uh, your D, uh, because it has answer and the original um, uh, area of the servitude. Then you go on to the right of way because it falls within the remaining extent. And then you go on to the expropriation notice. Um, uh, and then also um, you continue on to the ribbons uh, of the the roads and ribbons act 
uh, which is um, those conditions in D, which prohibits um, a, a property or rather a building being erected, as well as um, further subdivisions. Now, the thing here is somebody I saw typed or said something about uh, the condition says no further subdivision. Now, the first thing you have to understand here is that there is um, an act called um, uh, that deals with the um, the subdivision of agricultural land. Okay, so Faith Huntley is saying the condition that says the land may not be further subdivided. Are we not restricted in subdividing the property prescription? Well, the first thing that you have to understand and that you have to know off by heart by this time is that there is actually, when we spoke about um, subdivisions, we have properties in the township register and the, it's, uh, the sectional title register, and then we have farmland. And how on earth do we deal with farmland for purposes of subdivision? The act that I just referred to, subdivision of agricultural land, um, does not allow you to subdivide any farmland without the consent of the minister. So while the conditions of this, uh, this property says uh, you can't subdivide it, the fact remains is I can subdivide it if I do get the consent of the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture. So you have to get that consent and that has to be lodged with your application for subdivision when it comes to farmland. It's only for purposes of farmland that you require the consent of the minister. And good luck with that, because that's quite a frustrating thing as well. And this is also why, as I said before, is when we deal with anything, we have to look at all the legislation that surrounds it, because now it's easy to overlook the fact that we're dealing with farmland, and that's why we are referring to hectares instead of square meters in the extent of the property. It's so easy to overlook the fact that there is uh, that we're dealing with a farmland and that as such, we need to know the legislation that deals with that. Remember that in uh, the second lecture, I also said to you that if I have, uh, for instance, if I marry in community of property, if I'm, can you, uh, you're going to recall this right as soon as I complete this example, I said to you, if I'm, if we are married in community of pro uh, property, and I now get divorced, but we owned, uh, as part of the joint estate, the farm 312. The moment I get divorced and um, the, the, um, the divorce order or the settlement agreement doesn't deal with the farmland. So in other words, if the court, because you do not understand proprietary and consequences um, of the, uh, the the joint estate as well as the effect it has on the um, uh, possibility of transferring or vesting the parties as such, each with a half, half share in farmland, then again, you are really the worst possible attorney that there is to deal with that divorce. Because if you were a proper a functioning and educated conveyance uh, uh, attorney, you would also know the consequences of conveyancing when you prepare that settlement agreement, and you would know that you are prohibited from vesting uh, um, uh, parties in equal shares due to the division of the joint estate where there's um, agricultural land or a farm involved. You're not allowed to vest them each to the extent of their one half share when they divorce. Why? Because that is a subdivision of agricultural land. As long as, it, as it's held by both of the parties in community of property, it's an asset in its entirety. An asset in its entirety of the joint estate. So there's no possibility of uh, subdivision, but the moment you invest in half shares, you are subdividing or having the effect caused by that um, uh, that uh, order that the land is subdivided. So remember what I've said to you now, you should really not be preparing um, uh, divorce settlements if you do not know the, the uh, 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 what we know as conveyances. So 
very importantly, you, you would then under those circumstances when it's a, a farm, what we normally do is we either allow for a trust to be um, created or we transfer it into a company. Okay, you transfer it into a company or the parties agree that it's sold um, uh, by the both of them. Right, so very important there. So, um, and, and rather sell it prior to the order being granted, um, as I said. So, um, remember this, um, it's a very important thing, um, the consequences of the uh, Agricultural uh, Subdivision of Agricultural Land Act and what it prohibits and the consequences of holding farmland um, in, uh, in the joint estate. Okay, so uh, the wording, as I said, you can look a little bit more into um, how it's uh, dealt with. Now, um, if you look at the number three, the, the, the further figure, that's, uh, I hope everybody understands that. I haven't heard back from anybody, so I'm, I'm moving on. So now after I've subdivided into portion one, which has already been transferred, and the remaining extent, now let's say, for instance, um, the owner of the remaining extent is now deciding, okay, but now I'm going to further subdivide it into portion uh, two. So look at this again. Portion one is at the top. This remaining extent is in the middle. And then here we have the new proposed subdivision. Okay. So here we would now have another um, allocated um, component um, letter. And then this small Y, that is because it's a broken Y, a, a broken line, this would be part of a servitude. Always your broken lines are norm normally your servitudes, okay? So that's a proposed new division, a, a new subdivision. So the first thing we know is that we are going to firstly include that those conditions for, well, not firstly, but you will immediately um, remember that easy marks are condition D, which is um, the uh, Ribbons and Roads Act, okay? Uh, those D, A, B, and C conditions. Um, then I'm also going to remember that there was a right of way here, right? So that right of way condition B in the holding deed is definitely going to be in here. It's not going to be in the title deed of the remaining extent. It's only going to be in portion two's um, uh, uh, conditions. And then we have the expropriation. If we still don't know what it, uh, where it is situated, we would throw that in there. And then again, where we started off with that, those ancillary rights and the power line servitude, we know that the within property in its entirety, meaning the whole of the earth, is going to be subject to that, uh, 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 that EPL for purposes of what? Ancillary rights always, if, if that um, servitude area does not traverse um, the, um, the proposed... Um, uh, proposed uh, portion two, um, it would only be um, uh, ancillary rights, and if it does travel uh, the proposed for, uh, portion two, it would have the full condition, uh, not just with reference to the effect of the um, uh, the ancillary rights that is that uh, binds it. Okay, so um, this basically. Um, the servitude, no, note on, servitude notes on our new diagram for portion two. And here you're going to see now again component A, B, and then Y is our um, servitude line, C, D, back to A. Um, uh, immediately the servitude note says that that, um, uh, that notarial deed K189, that one, uh, is my servitude and it's, uh, it affects and it relates to my portion here, right? And then the other one is the southern boundary. So we know the southern boundary and that right of way, as I said immediately to you, it, it will be here because DC, this component area, we said southern boundary, middle line of a 10 meter line, at, um, 10 meter wide right of way. And then uh, that specific uh, servitude um, eight, uh, one, K189 is our power line servitude. So, um, again, 
we have to look at uh, the plotting of these um, uh, these conditions. And uh, for purposes, like I said, you will always first go to your servitude notes. Okay. So importantly, uh, portion two, the conditions are going to be uh, the same as the remaining extent initially. When we started off, that's what what we're going to be using as our, uh, our as our point of departure. And remember, in that remaining extent, we had the power line um, servitude, we had the expropriation, and we had the ribbons and road act. They called my um, cell phone. We had those, and um, obviously, uh, we used that for purposes of plotting of our conditions. And then, um, as we knew before, that uh, LG is basically Landmeter General. It's an Afrikaans abbreviation, LG. If your deed was in um, Afrikaans, you would use LG. Um, but we are drafting everything in English here. So this, you would actually use SG and not LG, because all along you have been dealing with, um, with uh, English abbreviations. So... Um, we we go back and we uh, we plot these and um, uh, specifically go back to our original conditions and compare any of the servitude notes. Very important. Okay. So as we continue on, you're going to um, get other uh, possibilities here um, for further subdivisions um, that all also deal with your um, with your um, conditions and how you continue to plot them with reference to ancillary rights and, and the like. So um, you can go through these examples. Um, the guys in Cape Town, I've looked for, uh, for some examples specifically for you. Um, uh, I, I have found one um, that we can apply. So I will be uploading that under the heading Cape Town only. Um, so that you can practice those as well with, relay, uh, with regards to your pervert deeds and the rest of the, the country basically um, can follow suit with um, the uh, plotting of the conditions as per KZN, etc. Uh, and Gauteng. Okay, so we can uh, keep on practicing these and, and continue on with them. Um, it's better for you to, to go and practice them as well. Um, if, uh, by yourself for purposes of drafting and understand that and then come back with questions relating to that. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, worry too much about uh, uh, the rest of it because you are going to look at it and come back with questions and you're going to try and apply to the questions that we will uh, discuss on Saturday. So now, uh, is there any questions below regarding this? Any questions? Okay, now um, before we go on to personal servitudes, I want us to uh, quickly, or I want to check just quickly um, whether or not you guys have actually um, uh, looked at all of the citations. Now, if we are talking about personal servitudes, then immediately you will think or you should think about those standard ones that we deal with um, uh, in the majority of the scenarios of the habitatio, the uh, usufruct and the uses. The uses being the use and enjoyment of the property, habitatio being the right to um, uh, occupy and inhabit the, um, uh, the property or a specific building. Remember, inhabit, habitatio, only a building will be, uh, will be obviously um, uh, identified for um, purposes of the habitatio. And then we have the usufruct, which includes all of the, uh, the uh, or both of the other two, um, together with the right to use and enjoyment of the property and its fruits, which includes I can rent out my property, uh, the, the property and the usufructuary is going to um, collect the rent um, personally. You have to, when we refer to uses, habitatio and usufruct, you have to know the common law and all the case law. Go and do some research regarding this as to what is the common law rights um, and obligations of the usufructuary, of the uses, 
of the um, Habitatio holder, as well as the Fide Commission, because there's another one, the Fide Commission. Right. So all of these have uh, obligations to maintenance uh, of the property. They also all have um, uh, uh, provisions that does not allow for um, certain um, uh, for uh, for diminishing in the value of the property, and if so, um, uh, what is the bare minimum uh, uh, percentages that uh, of the property that has to still be capable of being transferred to the bare dominium owner? Okay, now there I've basically said to you the two components that we have for a use of fruit. Uh, specifically, is our bare dominium owner, and then we have the uh, the the use of fructory. So, um, how would we cite then a situation where um, the the property is vested? It, it's from a will. The will basically um, bequeaths the the property to um, the children or the child, um, and the surviving spouse has a lifelong use of fruct. Um, can somebody pop into the um, comment section the um, uh, the description of a use of fructuary and a bare dominium owner as being vested? So they, the, this bare dominium and the uh, um, use of fructuary are being vested. I want to see if you've actually done the work on on um, citations. Okay, Adam has basically said Stephen Stanton, identity number, with the identity number, unmarried, the owner of the Bear Dominion. Um, and then he said, uh, uh, Pauline Scott, with the identity number, the holder of the use of fruct over the year he mentioned property. Remember, this is for purposes of the um, vesting clause. Um, can I see somebody else's input? Are you all in agreement that this is the um, this is the, the correct and proper wording. I'm still waiting and I'm waiting for a reason. Okay, since um, nobody's responding to that, I'm going to break for 10 minutes. And I, when I come back at uh, 20 past, um, oh wait, yeah, a 15 quarter past um, uh, by, uh, sorry, um, quarter past um, seven, I want to see more than one, more than one um, answer in the comment section. We're taking a break. We only have an hour left, or what hour of left after this. So pop in the.
Okay, guys, welcome back, and here we go. So, um, firstly, I see uh, Shimon Munich has said that she agrees to agrees with Alan's example, um, and then she says uh, she would state the creation of the use of truck by virtue of a will in order to show how the rights is created. <clears throat> Now, remember that, and, and I think this is extremely important, um, uh, very important, uh, that you understand that I asked a specific question regarding the vesting clause. And I said, how will they be cited in the vesting where they receive transfer? And Alan realized that there was a, a reason why I was asking this and why I specifically referred to that and why I said, are you all with this one? with um uh with with alan it, it doesn't matter what the names are um of of the parties it doesn't matter but it's about the citation now firstly um alan started off with uh, the citation of the um uh, bed aluminium owner as well as the usufructory in the uh, preamble so that's where they act as the uh, in their capacity to to pass transfer so what if two things can happen in a transaction where you are dealing with the bare dominium owner and the usufructory you can either have them sell together uh, or alienate for that matter together the, um, uh, the, the bare dominium as well as the, the use of fructuary rights. Or you can take the longer path by first cancelling the use of fruct. Remember that when you cancel a use of fruct for purposes of transfer duty, you have to also um, uh, lodge a transfer duty receipt because the um, calculation of transfer duty stems from the um, value to which rights are accrued. So in other words, the, um, the value that the bare dominium owner's um, uh, rights, that value that we put on the rights are now increased because remember I said I used an egg, the bare dominium owner is just the shell, the egg yolk and the egg white is um the is is everything that's inside um for purposes of the use of fructuary right so if i cancel the use of fruct i then um uh, cause the value of the bare dominium owner to increase and because it increases you are adding value to the um the, the bare dominium owner and therefore uh, because you cancel it that value that increases or that the um, that the uh, bare dominium owner now acquires by cancellation of your rights will attract transfer duty depending on the value of the use of fruct. So um, you can take either of these um, uh, uh, routes. Um, it's just much easier to deal with the um, uh, sale or transfer of a, pr a property by both the bare dominium owner as well as the user fructuary, and that's when we cite them both in the preamble for purposes of transfer, as opposed to first doing cancellation, causing, and, and when we do a cancellation of that user fruct, we would have to bring an application, and listen carefully now, you have to bring an application in terms of section 68 subsection 1 of the Deeds Registry Act, and therefore you would um, uh, have the title deed endorsed to the effect that that uh, personal servitude, the use of fruct, has been cancelled. And as I said before, that means that the value is increased for the bare dominium owner and it becomes full owner with the full um, uh, benefits of uh, the ownership as a real right. And that's why we lodge that transfer duty receipt. But we also bring that Section 68 application of, um, to have endorsed against that title deed. And then after we've done that, if you choose that route, you would pass a, a, a plain and simple form e-transfer by, uh, by the owner, which is now the bare dominium owner, just as per normal cit uh, citation. Uh, for instance, 
uh, Joe Black identity number uh, married out of community of property, that person uh, literally then passes um, transfer as the owner and no reference to be dominium uh, owner. So that's the first thing uh, that that kind of like um, uh, was uh, was referred to. Um, the uh, for purposes of the um, uh, the vesting clause. Um, okay, but but first I also want to just refer to Alan's um, description there as well. As Alan basically said, uh, for purposes of preamble, we're just going to use it like it's it's a preamble that Alan used. He's, he used the owner of the bare dominium. Now, just uh, bear in mind that for purposes of your um, your bare dominium owner, you will refer to him as one of two. You can either say as bare dominium owner, um, as such, okay. But uh, it doesn't really matter. That's basically how you would um, uh, cite um, the person. So you'd say as B dominium owner, or you would say as the B dominium owner. Irrespective, you can use as B dominium owner or as the B dominium owner. Important to remember that that's owner and not holder of rights. And then if you continue on with the um, description that uh, Stephen, uh, sorry, um, Alan used in the um, comments box, um, he then goes on uh, to say, um, and Pauline Scott, uh, identity number and unmarried, the holder of usufruct over the year mentioned property. Now, there you uh, should ideally use the uh, words as usufructory or as the usufructory. Okay. Um, the reason why I specifically chose this um, because I first because I knew you were going to confuse the um, the uh, the preamble. Everybody would confuse the preamble with the actual um, the the actual vesting uh, uh, clause for the uh, you know initially why I asked the question, um, but also for the fact that um, I literally did a transfer like this uh, recently and I um, uh, used the word holder and I got a reject well not a rejection note prior to lodging it um, I was actually advised as that it won't go through at the deeds office uh, with reference to a holder of the the use of fract. Um, uh, the, there's, there's some issue with the, the wording of holder as usufruct, so do not use the word holder of usufruct, uh, rather use the wording as um, usufructory or as the usufructory. Okay, don't, don't refer to holder. Okay, so um, important there that you just have that. Um, obviously, yes, you continue on of the year, uh, with the year mentioned uh, land um, uh, only if um, you you literally are dealing with um, uh, with uh, your your parties in the vesting clause and not in the preamble. Because remember, I'm now critiquing Alan's example for um, for um, for the for the vesting clause, which we are talk, we are discussing under the preamble, which is not the vesting clause. So. First thing there uh, to refer to um, the uh, the bare dominium owner as as one of two being as uh, bare dominium owner or as the, the bare dominium owner and the second thing is to cite the usufructory as this as usufructory or as the usufructory but not um, as the holder of usufruct over the year major property don't don't use that okay don't use that uh, that will in all likelihood attract a, a note um, or even a rejection. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, um, uh, there were a couple of um, with things that, for instance, Shimon said she would continue on further. Um, the problem is, as Shimon, is that you do not refer to the um, uh, the conditions or the reasons for um, the the creation of the rights because firstly in the preamble you do not do that because it's already vested and when the transfer was done um, the conditions of the title deed or not the title deed the conditions of the will was brought forward in 
the title deed because that's where we created it. We first created them by reference of uh, to the, the will conditions by the deceased. And then we basically put them in the power of attorney and had them um, carried forward in the title deed. Okay, so understand that. As I don't reference in the preamble at all the um, point or the reason for creation, because if I'm dealing with the preamble, I am now transferring those rights. And where were they? They were put into the conditions of title. Do you understand, Shimon? So it's already in existence in the conditions of the title deed that it, the, 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 um, the property is held under. So I do not refer and I don't go further to refer to already created deeds, uh, created conditions. But furthermore, if Shimon was referring to the actual um, vesting clause, then again, you wouldn't refer to the creation of that, but you would put those conditions under the um, uh, under the conditions where uh, clause where it says um, this property is transferred, and then we start and we go forward with the um, uh, with the um, uh, with the, the the mentioning of the different uh, of, of the wills conditions. Okay, so we verbatim take them out of the will and then prepare them as such with reference. So then there was Kunrat that basically said um, that uh, the vesting clause would be, for instance, Mark White, um, identity number married out of community of property, um, and then Julie James, identity number married um, in community of property um, to Justin. And um, Kunrat, that's great. Thank you for using Harvey LaRue's notes. I'm sure that was his example um, that you used there with, with reference to married in community of property. Um, and as I said, this is basically, uh, this question was asked to make you think about what am I dealing with, the vesting clause, or am I dealing with the preamble? So whilst Kunrat would be correct if indeed the vesting was um, done towards um, a person married out of community of property with any kind of name or whatever and the identity number and then in a person that is married in community of property but remember that when we do receive receive personal rights it only attached to attaches to the specific person it cannot fall within the ambit of a uh, of the joint estate i'm going to repeat that if you choose to create details um, for purposes of a party that's vested, um, that are married in community of property, the reason that vesting um, uh, uh, is the way that it is um, in Kunrad's example is purely because the person who was then um, uh, vested with the property um, was named um, in the will and it excludes by implication of the working of a personal uh, servitude, it excludes um, uh, um, the joint estate. So community of property is excluded when you create a personal servitude and vests a person married in community of property with a personal servitude, irrespective of whether or not it's a fide commissum, a use of fracta, habitatia, or a uses. Does everybody understand that? So the crux of this is when I vest parties with their dominium and uh, um, uh, a personal right such as a usufruct, then under those circumstances, I do not refer to them as usufructuary and or uh, their dominium owner. I wanted you to specifically understand this concept. Is everybody with me? Okay, I'm going to accept that we are all on the same page and I'm going to continue. Um, I see there's one comment. Okay, please repeat that, Jesse, the whole part. Um, okay, uh, what I said was is that um, if a person is vested who are uh, with a, a personal right such as usufruct, uh, uh, as a usufructuary or a, the vedominium owner, then you have to understand that the limited right, the, the, the personal right, which is limited in its nature, its nature only to 
the use and enjoyment of the property and its fruits, and also by virtue of the fact that it is personal in nature and only attaches to the person, then under those circumstances, I refer to the, the, the parties as the person, identity number, um, uh, married in community of property to the person, the, the, the other spouse. Why? Because the personal right of a usufruct does not fall in the joint estate. It, um, it attaches only to the person mentioned or that is referred to in terms of the will. Okay, so that is the basis of this. Firstly, um, distinguish between the preamble, that is where the fault came in with what um, uh, uh, Alan initially cited. Secondly, um, uh, uh, be careful of the joint estate where you vest. Thirdly, um, when I am dealing to, with the um, uh, the uh, uh, with the preamble and the transfer all, refer to the persons as um, bare dominium owner or as the bare dominium owner and as usufructory or as the usufructory, but not holder of bare dominion, okay, or holder of usufruct, okay. So important there, and I explained uh, the community of property and the reasons for that, uh, the difference in vesting as opposed to the examples that were used previously. Obviously, when you transfer and you have a joint estate as community of property, then obviously you would still refer to the uh, use of fractory as um, for instance, uh, Jane Plain, identity number, married in community of property to John Plain, for instance. Okay, so I'm going to step off of that and uh, we're going to just continue on um, on uh, with um, the personal servitudes, uh, the, uh, the personal servitudes on uh, in your notes. So specifically, um, Remember that um, we are dealing here with the personal rights that attaches only to the person, okay? Only to the person's person. And how do we know it's it's limited in its nature? Because it restricts full ownership and the capacity of the owner to deal with its property without um, uh, the um, consultation uh, with the um, uh, with any other person, so it prohibits it. It restricts my uh, capacity to um, deal with my property because here's the other thing that you have to remember um, for purposes of uh, understanding conveyancing and the the proprietary rights. At the end of the day, we always hear that um, uh, the the banks are preferent. Yeah. They have the strongest claims, but that is not true. That is not true. When it comes to personal servitudes, personal servitudes such as a habitatio uses um, uh, uh, usufruct, as well as a long lease, and there's a number of different other things that we can refer to um, under um, these kinds of rights, um, they are stronger than the bond. They are stronger than the bond. Why are they stronger than the bond? Well, because at the end of the day, before I can transfer property, I would have to get either cancellation of an existing um, uh, personal right, or I would have to uh, enter into some form of an agreement um, uh, to compensate that person for that the value of that, that personal right. The other alternative is that it has to lapse due to reflection of time or the death of the party, because if that person dies, that holds that personal right, then the right ceases. It falls back to the bare dominium owner. Okay, so important to remember that is that it is such a strong right that if there is a mortgage bond being registered, the mortgage bond, uh, the the mortgagee, the bank, or whoever it is, if it's a natural person, that person is going to insist that the um, the use of fractory waives its preference. This is the first time that we are 
referring to this concept and that we deal with it in in under the, the chapter of bonds. And let me remind you that you could expect 45 marks of the 200 in drafting coming from coming. bonds. Is somebody trying to speak? Okay, I'm going to continue. Now everybody's there, but please mute your um, angel. Are you? Do you want to say something? I can see that you unmuted. Okay, there she muted. So important. Um, always remember this. If we're going to register anything, we uh, when it comes to a mortgage bond, that that mortgagee, the the um, uh, the person that extends the credit, for instance, that person is going to insist that that um, uh, holder of those rights are going, uh, um, has to first waive its preference. Okay, I can't sell it without dealing with the, that uh, those limited rights. So, and if I waive my preference and I'm sitting with, and I hold a, a user fruct at the end of the day, what could happen is that the property could be sold and in e execution, maybe you didn't, the bond wasn't paid, etc., and you would not um, have a stronger right um, as opposed to your mortgagee, the bank, etc. So important to know these things. Over and above this, um, you have to remember that before all of these rights, you have the rights of the state, which means SARS is first in line uh, when it comes to its claims against a, a, a property and the proceeds. So other um, uh, irrespective of what you do or whether you discuss the property eventually, you're going to have to deal with that the, the personal servitude uh, as, uh, as a, a limited right. And then also you're going to have to deal with SAR if there's outstanding um, debts, which also means that following that, another uh, tax is your property tax as an owner, which is your rates and taxes. So think about that for a sequence of people to deal with when it comes to claims. And then you realize that the mortgagee, the bank, is not the, the preferent above all other claims um, or creditors. Okay, so I got you to think a little bit there about this. So um, uh, back to um, our, uh, our personal servitudes. Um, we've already just uh, mentioned the habitatio, the usufruct and, and the uses, and quickly told you to make sure that you um, remember and understand, uh, remember to look at the common law and understand and know it. Okay, and that means you've got to do a lot of reading in this regard. So after this, we have, well, when we get to deal with um, servitudes and personal servitudes as such, we have to look at section 67 of the DRA, which basically allows for the creation of personal servitudes. And what's very nice is that these um, conditions, or rather these servitudes are dealt with from uh, section 65, dealing with the registration of notarial deed, creating personal servitudes, then going on to um, uh, section 66, the uh, restriction of the rights, and then the reservation of a ser personal servitude. So we're going to start off by first just explaining uh, the content of section 65. Sorry, uh, my thing slipped there. Um, so we're going to start off with um, the specific uh, 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 sections of the Deeds Registry Act, starting off with uh, the uh, registration of notarial deeds creating personal servitudes. And from this, you're going to see those ex uh, situations where we have said to you there's a general rule. You always create um, these personal servitudes by way of a notarial deed, but then there's the exceptions. Okay, and uh, to start off with the um, with the general rule, the golden rule. Okay, and it says, save as provided in any other law, a personal servitude may be created by means of a deed executed by the owner of the land, encumbered thereby, and the person in whose favour it is created and attested by a notary public. So the first reason, the first golden rule, or the golden rule is. You will create a personal servitude by means of a 
notarial deed executed by a notary public. Okay. Then it goes on and it says, but, okay, or rather provided that in the case of a servitude in favor of the public or of all or some of the owners or occupiers of urban or lots in a township or settlement, the registrar may, if in the opinion, uh, if he is in the opinion or she is in the uh, of the opinion, that it is impracticable to require such deed to be executed by all of these persons. So uh, the first thing is, is you create a personal servitude by way of notarial deed executed in front of the notary by the owners okay, so in, of the land so encumbered. But if a deed or, or if a, um, uh, a servitude is going to be in uh, favor of the, the general public or the public as such, or in favor of a, a group of owners or occupiers of urban in a township, then under those circumstances, that general rule does not apply. But it has to be in the opinion of the registrar that it is impracticable um, uh, to have that deed that is executed in front of the notary, okay? that that is signed by all of those parties. Because if you look at the wording public and um, all the owners, then you know it's a bunch of people and it's not going to be um, uh, uh, easy to do that. It's going to be, uh, it's not a practical example to have people there um, all coming to sign. The whole of the, uh, the all, I mean the public, everybody, and it changes from day to day. It's the same with occupiers. So that's my first exception. Public, if that servitude is in favor of public or um, in a township, uh, owners or um, occupiers. Right. Then it goes on. Okay. Under those circumstances, uh, uh, it's going to be difficult. And then it, go, it continues on. Um, uh, uh, let me just finish that um, sentence. The urban lots um, in a township or settlement, the registrar may, if in his opinion, it is impracticable to require such deed to be executed by the persons in whose favor, it's, uh, favor the servitude is created, registers such deed, notwithstanding the fact that it has not been executed by such persons, provided further that where it is desired to register a road or thoroughfare. So now we are talking about a right of way. Of are we talking about a right of way or are we take, talking about a road? Because there's different legislation dealing with roads being created as opposed to rights of way. But it also refers here to a thoroughfare, okay, in favor of the public at the same time as the registration of a subdivision which it serves. So now we have to understand that when it comes to a road, that has to be created uh, simultaneously with registration. Um, also, if it's a situation of a thoroughfare, and again, it is in favor or it serves the public. Okay. Um, that's uh, when there's a, a, a subdivision that occurs simultaneously. Then it shall, in, uh, in like manner and without registration of a notarial deed, be permissible to register it in a deed relating to the subdivision and also to endorse the deed. So what does that mean? In those circumstances, I could have this um, uh, not prepared by a notary and executed by uh, in front of the notary by way of the, uh, um, uh, a notarial deed. But in fact, I can create um, the actual condition in a power of attorney because it would be a subdivision in favor of. And once that happens, then with my subdivision, because I'm going to be subdividing my own land, okay, whoever it is, and I'm going to register a specific um, condition uh, as per servitude in favor of the public again, right? Then I can create it in my power of attorney as the transfer role, 
and carry it forward in my deed. But again, this has to deal with a subdivision. Then further it goes on. Uh, obviously, you would have that title deed uh, uh, endorsed to the effect of those conditions and the creation thereof. Um, and further provided that um, conditions which restrict the exercise of any right of ownership in immovable property may be included in any deed of transfer of such immovable property tendered for registration in such conditions, if such conditions are capable of being enforced by some person who is mentioned in, or if not mentioned therein, um, is ascertainable from the deed of transfer or from other evidence. And such person, if determinable, has um, signified acceptance of such a right. So somebody has to accept that right. So that's what it comes down to. And in this, as I said, this, um, uh, okay, um, Dangan Yeni, we are talking about the creation of a personal servitude, which has the general condition that says you make uh, you you have to create these servitudes by way of an arterial deed, and then it has uh, sub um, uh, um, provisions that deals with creation in favour of the public or a group of per people as uh, um, owners, alternatively occupiers, and then if I subdivide and it is in uh, favour of um, uh, of the public and also further the, the, this is section 65 okay and also further um, uh, uh, if the the right is accepted so that's the gist of section 65 I said to you before when we talk about if you, you're dealing with any form of um, personal rights or servitudes then you're always going to refer back to um, uh, back to section 65 to um, uh, 69, those are personal, and then the same in the at the same token as uh, section 65 to 69 deals with personal. Then just uh, after that, you get a section 70, uh, uh, 75 onwards that deals with prideal servitudes. I've said that in a previous lecture. Always remember it like that. If you have to uh, remember sections and you're dealing with prideal or personal, 65. Personal. So whatever sections are in the 60s, personal. Whatever sections are in the 70s, prideal. Okay, so we're just quickly looking at this um, quickly from the general rule, because I have summaries for your personal servitude, so that makes it very clear, but it doesn't help if you have that act next to you and you can't interpret it. So that's the first thing. And then in the subsection one, such deeds shall contain a sufficient um, description of the land encumbered by the servitude and shall mention the title deed, obviously, because we have to endorse that title deed. Uh, three, land to uh, be encumbered by a personal servitude is mortgage or subject to any other real right um, with which the said personal servitude may, uh, may conflict. There it is, conflict. C, it's, a bond isn't stronger than, than this personal right. If it conflicts with the bond, uh, with a bond, the bond or other registered deed by which such right is held shall be produced to the registrar with, together with a consent in writing of the legal holder of such a bond or other right to the registration of said personal servitude and in case of a bond, free from the bond. So in other words, you have to get the consent. If, if I'm creating it whilst there's already a mortgage bond, I have to get the consent by the mortgagee. Okay to register that personal servitude because as I, uh, I've just read to you, it may conflict with the rights of the, the mortgagee. Then uh, section 66, mark them or highlight them, uh, restrictions on registration of personal servitudes. It says no person, uh, personal servitude of usufruct, uses of or habitatio, those three that we spoke about minutes ago, purporting to extend beyond the lifetime of the person in whose favour it is created, shall be registered, nor may a transfer or cession of such personal servitude to any person other than the owner of the land encumbered, thereby be registered. So the first thing that we know now is that a personal servitude, especially uh, with reference to use of uses or habitatio, those can never be registered uh, um, to the effect that they extend beyond the lifetime of the person benefiting it from it. Okay. So 
you cannot create such a, a, a servitude. You cannot register it, okay? And then it goes on, nor may a transfer or cession of such a personal servitude to any person other than the owner of the land incumbent hereby be registered, which means you, under no, no circumstances, can, can effectively register that form of open uh, servitude extending beyond the lifetime, which in, in turn means you cannot word that servitude to the effect that the, um, uh, the um, beneficiary of that right, that servitude, okay, um, benefits from it as well as that person's successors in title. So you cannot refer to uh, the successors in title of the person um, in whose favor the usufruct, uses and arbitratio uh, is being registered. Okay. But then it says, uh, other than the owner of the land incumbent thereby, so I, I, if I'm going to do that, then at the end of the day, it, uh, uh, it requires that um, I have to register that or I have to uh, benefit the owner of the land, which basically comes down to you would have to um, vest the owner of the land with that benefit. So in short, no registration or wording of personal servitudes that you create in the power of attorney uh, to the extent that it extends beyond the lifetime of the, um, uh, the uh, beneficiary of the right. I can have a usufruct, usus or arbitratio for a period in, of time. So, in other words, I can say it's registered for the for eight years, where after it will automatically lapse by a fluxion of time. Or um, uh, I could basically um, refer to it as a, a, a lifelong um, servitude of usufruct in favour of the usufructuary. Okay, so. Importantly, I, there was an article recently um, justifying the um, wording of uh, personal servitudes to the effect that they are capable of uh, registering uh, or being registered uh, uh, for a period that extends beyond the lifetime of the beneficiary. When I say beneficiary, I mean the person that has the rights, the use of factory. Um, uh, I personally don't believe that it's necessarily possible. You have to remember that <clears throat> when we talk about personal rights, though, or personal servitude, you could have these in favor of a company as well. And that company um, will only be deprived of that personal right once the company ceases to exist. So, in other words, once it is um, deregistered as such. Okay. Because I can literally um, uh, register a personal servitude in favor of a company or a trust. Okay. Remember the concept of personal includes the entity. Okay. Right. Uh, 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 includes a legal entity, trust, or that. Then in section 67, we deal with the reservation of personal servitudes, and it says a personal servitude may be reserved by condition in a deed of transfer of land if the reservation, and here comes your your um, your important um, uh, provisos. So in other words, first in 65 it says use a notarial deed. Then in 66 or 67 it, it says the uh, in 66 it limits it the lifetime of the uh, limits it to the lifetime uh, lifetime of the use factory. Um, and then in 66 it comes and it tells you when can I create these conditions in a power of attorney without a notarial deed being executed and carry it forward in my deed. So the first one is um, you may reserve them by condition in a deed of transfer of the land if the reservation is in favor of the transferor or in favor of the transferor and his or her spouse or the survivor of them. So now we're dealing with estates right there. I'm dealing with Estates. Does it limit it um, uh, uh, to any specific um, matrimonial property regime? Yes. Immediately, if you um, read on, it says 
if they are married in community of property. So in other words, I can create these by reservation in, uh, uh, in the power of attorney and the deed, if it's in favor of the transferor. Or in favor of the transferor and his or her um, spouse, or the surviving of them, if they are married in community of property. So my transferor could have the, the personal servitude created in its own favor, Okay, or in favor of him and his spouse, okay, if they are married in community of property, or the survivor of them. Right. Um, and then it goes on to say, uh, in favor of the surviving spouse, if transfer is passed or given from the joint estate of the spouses who were married in community of property. So estates, this is where we get into estates. And this is why when we have a situation that the, the, uh, that the um, transferor is creating this personal right, we can create it in the power of attorney, carry it forward under the circumstances where it's in his favor or it is in favor of um, the surviving spouse at the death of the, the parties uh, or, or one of the, the spouses, the surviving one, that is when we can create them. And that's why the use of drugs are so easily created in powers of attorney um, when we are dealing with the, the joint estate. But remember that transfer all is transferring the property. He's creating it. Um, for his benefit or his wife's benefit. So that means he's transferring, for instance, Earth 102. Okay. But he is simultaneously registering a uh, servitude in favor of um, himself, the joint estate, um, uh, uh, or the surviving spouse. Right. So that's where I created for the transfer all. We're going to see examples of that um, uh, 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 when we deal with this in more depth. Then uh, registration or lapse of a personal servitude. We, um, we know already that if I want to um, uh, deal with or take out this condition, I have to bring a section 68.1 application. But also remember is if I consolidate the property, then um, they also can lapse due to merger, okay, due to mer merger. So in short, if you look at 2.1, it says there that I can create them directly in the deed. And when I say I create them in the deed, it means I first put them in the power of attorney because it can't show up on itself in the uh, deed of transfer. I create them in the power of attorney, but only in those circumstances where it's in favor of the transferor, the transferor and his spouse or the survivor of them if they are married in community of property or the surviving spouse if transfer is passed from the joint estate of the spouses who are married in community of property. Now, this is exactly uh, the situation where um, that Kunrad used there, where he, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the surviving spouse so in other words, um, uh, one of the um, uh, parties have died and in the will, it basically reserved uh, or rather created a, uh, a personal servitude in, uh, of usufruct, for instance, in favor of the surviving spouse. Okay. And then the beta minimum would be, be vested in the, um, uh, in the children, for instance. Right. Um, remember that all of these relates to um, it being created in favor of the transferor or in favor of the transferor and his spouse or the survivor of them. Or if it's not the, the, the um, transferor and his spouse, okay, when they married, married in community of property, then only the surviving spouse, okay. But then this um, joint estate is going to pass uh, ownership to um, uh, the uh, 
appointed is, and then the, this limited personal right, this limited right is going to um, uh, vest in the surviving spouse. Okay, so important here uh, to remember that there's only these exceptions when I can uh, create them without a notarial deed, only these situations. Otherwise, I always have to have uh, use that notarial deed, uh, 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 use the notarial deed executed uh, in front of the notary by the actual owners. Okay, so again, information that those of you who are doing notarial practice, you will find very uh, uh, useful when uh, um, doing servitudes in in depth. Okay, so um, you can just uh, uh, look at um, the information that we have uh, below this specifically with regards to section 65. Why? Because it tells you what kind of a, ser uh, uh, a servitude or notarial deed you will have to prepare. Now, if you look at the fact that we can use either uh, a unilateral notarial deed, that means that, for instance, if I am creating it, uh, creating uh, this um, uh, personal servitude, the servitude is basically executed by the transferor of the land, the owner, right? And now it is a situation, for instance, where um, we, we cannot have everybody um, signed, uh, sign the um, uh, the the acceptance by way of uh, the notarial deed, then you have to understand is under those circumstances, I would only create it by way of unilaterally, uh, unilateral deed. So in other words, only I as the session, a cedent, as the cedent will sign unilaterally, only I will sign, the creator of these rights will sign um, the notarial deed, and that is a uni unilateral notarial deed. If I have both the cedent and the sessionary um, signing the deed, the notarial deed, then we call it a bilateral not notarial deed. And this means that the, uh, the uh, cedent cedes the rights and the uh, sessionary accepts the, re the rights as described in the bilateral notarial deed. And look at the uh, application of this, as we said before, the general rule saying, uh, create them in the notarial deed. So if it doesn't fall within the ambit of the exceptions, then I would always use a bilateral, two people signing the notarial deed, as opposed to using a unilateral, where only one person uh, cedes the rights and the other person does not um, assign the um, uh, the notarial deed. Okay, so we've looked at um, uses and usufruct um, for purposes of creation in um, uh, in the will. Look at again if we refer you to a, a, a regulation, that means you need to have a look at it, um, uh, and then uh, finally in section sixty nine and two. Uh, the bare dominium owner is being dealt with. Um, and, and this is specifically that uh, scenario that I painted that said you can either have both parties as bare dominium and usufructory parts transfer and dispose of the property, or you could go the route of cancelling first. That's a personal servitude, but then you have to have a, a transfer duty for that and a transfer duty for the passing of ownership. So two transfer duties. And um, from the complaints I receive daily about uh, SAR um, and how s uh, slow they are to issue transfer duty receipts, um, you do, may not want to take the longer, um, the longer road. Obviously, uh, there could also be a, a, a cancellation agreement. And when we do that, we have to pass or rather execute in front of a notary a, notary, a formal uh, deed of cancellation. So a notarial deed of cancellation of the servitude, whether it is a usufruct, a usus, or a habitatio. Okay, so always read, read section 66, 65, uh, and 67 in its entirety when 
you have to consider um, uh, answering a question regarding whether or not um, you could create uh, the conditions and whether you have to prepare um, a notarial deed. Okay, so um, with these parties that are married out of community of property, you will always use the um, uh, the the um, notarial deed because as those exceptions are there, it, uh, the uh, exceptions relate to uh, the uh, joint estate. Um, so you could uh, just um, have a look at these uh, 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 examples of um, the condition that as it would appear in your title deed. So um, reference the subject to the life use of fruct in favour of uh, whoever the person is and whose favourite is created identity number married out of community of property in terms of the will of the late whoever as will more fully appear from a notarial deed of session. I have to create here a, a, a deed of session, formal notarial deed of session, as opposed to using one of the exceptions. And then uh, the, the other um, alternative, uh, again, subject to a life use of in favour of John Brown, with his identity number, again, and a person made out with the property in terms of the will of the late whoever, as will more fully appear from notarial deed of, of session of use of number whatever. Uh, remember, this you, uh, this um, will be registered at the same time as the, the, the transfer, so you would leave the number out or uh, open uh, because the registrar is going to come with a stamp and stamp the next number for execution uh, in there. Okay, just like your title deed, you don't have already when you lodge it the T number stamped in, only when you execute it or when the registrar stamps it in after registration do you receive that new holding title deed number. The same with your notarial deeds. Okay, um, I've already touched on um, the lapse of um, servitudes and cancellation of them. It's either merger, I've, I'm taking transfer of uh, the property that is encumbered um, with the servitude. I can't serve myself. So that's the rule. You don't serve yourself um, as uh, when you um, when you have this kind of servitude or right. You will never uh, serve yourself as the owner of the land. Therefore, when you merge, it lapses automatically. Uh, lapse due to a fluxion of time. There's a period assigned to it, or you, I enter into a bilateral notarial deed. Again, if I take away person's rights, I would enter into a, a, a notarial deed that will um, require the acceptance of the cancellation and the agreement uh, as such uh, constitutes um, a meeting of the mind and consensus to the effect that I'm going to, uh, that we agree to cancel the, the um, servitude by bilateral um, notarial deed. Okay, so uh, you can uh, uh, read um, uh, the balance of this, again, there's a reference to one of the circulars for um, Johannesburg. As I said, um, we we have a, a, a different way of dealing with um, uh, mergers here in KZN. I recently did um, a lapse by merger of a, notar a notarial deed. I think it was a use of, yes, it was a use of fact. Um, uh, so, um, I noticed that um, they, they refer here to a registrar circular um, for Johannesburg, and um, I know that we de deal with it in a different form here in KZN, and I will let you have an example of that. But again, it's a notarial document, so I don't think you need it at this point in time. If you need it when you're doing notar notaries, you can always call me if you're in KZN and want to write the exam. Okay, so important here. <clears throat> Uh, to always remember um, the mortgage or, uh, or the mortgagee, the, the land being encumbered, that um, uh, there has to be a, a consent to that um, that, uh, that registration of the, the personal servitude. Um, remember that, otherwise you, you're going to be rejected um, if you don't lodge that consent. Um, and also remember... Uh, the consequences again um, 
with regards to anything that's already encumbered. And if you want to cancel those um, bonds, again, you have to get uh, consents uh, there. Right, my voice is almost going. And um, I think we've done uh, sufficient work. I, the only thing that I'm going to... Um, Okay, Mdangani, okay, they answered you that it's section 65, so I think that's that's done. Okay, so there's no other questions. Um, I'm just going to start off with, uh, by saying those prideal servitudes, again, uh, we would create them again as notarial deeds. Okay, um, here we refer to um, your dominant servitude or tenement, sorry, dom dominant uh, dominant a tenement and the servient, servient uh, tenement. Remember I said you don't serve yourself um, in personal servitudes. Now in this situation, it's very clear that we have a dominant earth that is benefiting from um, uh, the uh, registration of a prideal earth, uh, a prideal servitude. And we have the serving, the servient tenement. He's, he's the, this is the property serving the dominant tenement. So he, one property serves the other by allowing, for instance, a right of way over uh, the um, servient tenement, being the earth allowing access across it to benefit the dominant earth, um, which is the one benefiting from that. Now, again, section 75, section 76 uh, specifically uh, provide for those situations where um, I can uh, register and create the condition in the power of attorney without having a notarial deed. And this is mostly um, found in subdivisions. And the gist of this is I can create these conditions without a notarial deed if it is over land that I am um, um, uh, um, transferring as the owner in favor of land that I am retaining. So that means I am subdividing my own property. I'm transferring off, for instance, um, portion one. Now, at that point, I can, with, when I'm dealing with the subdivision, I can creating the power of attorney, a, con, a, a, a servitude over the land that I am transferring off in favor of the land that I'm retaining. Those, that's one of my um, situations or um, uh, uh, situations, yeah, situations um, that I, uh, the, in which I can create these in my power of attorney and carry it for, forward, okay? So that's that's one of them. The uh, the other is is um, remember we can always um, uh, refer to servitudes without reference to a servitude diagram. We don't always have to have a servitude diagram if we can describe that um, that servitude uh, by wording that would allow us to. Um, plot the condition. So that would be those situations where it's of uniform width. Remember I said to you when we did the plotting of the conditions for um, the earth um, prescription 312 or rather the farm prescription 312 earlier in the, the evening, we, uh, I said to you um, if it, that specific condition is an example of um, uniform width in its description, running along the entire surveyed line. That means I can't st stop in the middle of nowhere. It has to go from uh, the, uh, the, the, the one um, boundary component line to the other one. Okay. So um, important uh, that, that you remember that is I can, I can describe it without having to have a servitude actually uh, surveyed or a, ser a servitude uh, diagram prepared, as long as I can describe it in uh, by words. So it's uniform width along the whole boundary. 
I see we're starting to lose a couple of people. We've dropped off a couple of people um, as, as, as uh, left. Um, I know somebody had said that they need to leave early because they need to do uh, community um, service to areas that are affected by um, the riots. Um, so we can, for the moment, um, stop here. But I'm going to upload under servitudes, the chapter on servitudes, and under this, the same um, uh, uh, explanations regarding servitudes, because we're dealing with, the, with them in much more uh, detail uh, under notaries, but also uh, we, we deal with them uh, when we do subdivisions. Okay. So um, uh, if, if you are... Um, Okay, with this, we've covered a lot of um, uh, ground here. I, I just want to um, say something uh, for those of you who are not affected by what we are going through in uh, KZN. I want to tell you that um, the stress, the uncertainty um, that we are living through now, those of you who are in uh, Gauteng that's also living through this, the areas of the country that's not affected by this, um, I hope, honestly, that you are not affected by this. Um, I, for instance, have been waiting for two months to have um, an abscess in my mouth treated by a dentist. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, to have my appointment continued today. Um, it was at 7.30 already in the morning. Um, I then got issued with a script for antibiotics and I had to go and queue at the only um, pharmacy that was open and there is in excess of 20 pharmacies in Amanzam Doty. There's only one that actually could issue me with, this, with my meds for antibiotics um, that, uh, that, that I could get it filled. Um, and I stood there and there were people um, that were wanting to ha buy um, formula and nappies and the pharmacist had to tell them we're we out, we don't have nappies. There is no other pharmacy that's open at the moment. Uh, we have four shops providing it in the whole of a man's and um, uh, I uh, Really, those of you who are not affected by this, this is the worst I have ever seen, seen things and it is disheartening to the point where I'm a very um, uh, in control kind of person and I, I believe that showing emotions is a sign of weakness. Um, I have to say that I was in very close to tears today when I saw what we were going through. Um, and I honest to God hope that none of you uh, that are not here in these provinces are going to go through this. It is the worst time of uncertainty and I'm not talking politics now. Um, I hope you all stay safe. Um, I continue. I couldn't do much today because um, they were installing after the hacking um, my uh, ghost convey server again. Um, so I couldn't do a lot of the work that I wanted to upload, but I am going to um, uh, do everything I can. Um, and um, I will make sure that you still benefit from every single lecture that we will have. So please um, stay safe, everybody. And um, yeah, this is not easy for any of the attorneys in their own practices at the moment. We don't know when we will access Peter Maritzburg again. We certainly don't anticipate that it will be this week. So if there's any questions relating to this, or um, I wanted to do, deal with an estate matter that somebody asked a question, but specifically with relevance to um, when we use a partition transfer, but I'm going to let that stand over because I'm a bit frail as well at the moment, and I need to go and take my antibiotics again. So if there's any questions, please, um, you can. Um, I'll allow for five minutes, and then we can break up. I just want to take coffee to our controllers as well. Uh, hi, Marika, it's Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi. Yes, yeah. I can. Thank you. Um, sorry to hear about your situation, and I hope things improve. Um, yes. But you guys are also affected, I saw, to some extent. Yeah, in Cape Town. It's, it, it, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Sad, sad to say. Yeah. Um, but can I ask a question with regards yeah. to the predial servitudes? Uh, yes. I, 
I'm, it's a little bit off where we are at at the moment, dealing yeah. with partitioning. And when you when you partition, for, for my question relates around farms. You partition yes. a farm into two two portions, yes. um, and to to create access to water. Yes. Uh, do you have to do a pradial servitude, or is that a personal? I don't think it's a personal servitude. I thought it was a pradial no, servitude. It's radial. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's a right of way. Yeah, um, it's it's not a right. Okay. You have to look at a potable wa uh, um, water source and its legislation, but also you have a servitude for pump house purposes that allows you to create it in general terms or um, within the ambit of the. Um, uh, a subdivision of agricultural land that allows for it without a, ser a, a servitude diagram. So um, okay. uh, we just need to look at that. And um, as I said, is we really have to look at that um, Agricultural Land Subdivision Act. Um, everybody, since I was at Varsity, and I think you as well, we've been told that, um, oh, you know, the subdivision of agricultural land is being repealed, but it hasn't been repealed yet. That's why we still have to get the consents from the minister. And that was actually, that that whole legislation is there to, to prohibit that we have uh, farmland s sourcing food cut up into small uh, uneconomical uh, portions of land that, that doesn't secure our, our food sources. So uh, that's why it's still in place. Okay. No, I understand that. Send, me your, just... send me your example uh, or what you okay. are thinking about, and then I'll give you all the application of that. But but that would be, that would definitely, that could be actually, um, depending on the situation, it could serve more than one property around an earth um, if there's yeah. only one quotable water, uh, water source. Um, alternatively, it could just be in favour of one of the um, of the farms, and then we also have to consider boreholes and the borehole certificates that is required, yeah. etc. Yeah. For the yield, yeah. I, you have to have the yield certificate. So, um, send me what you are thinking about, and then I can give you more information, and we can do it in in the lecture to just give quick reference to it for the rest of the group. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Because I'm definitely going Thanks. to deal with um, the person that asked about the, uh, um, the, the it's a one third and a one third and a one third. And then the two of the owners wants to um, uh, each have portion one. And so we have to look at the potential for partitioning as opposed to subdivision. Yeah. And then the, the other the other one that I wanted to do, I, I might take it offline with you instead is citing when 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 we start citing um the shares in in yes. property i know i know when it's an when it's an equal share between two two or or more owners then you yes. don't necessarily have to cite the share but if you're only dealing with a 50% part and then there are the heirs or beneficiaries that are going to accept it or receive the land yes. um it might be different in that respect. That's what I yes. wanted to check. Yes, and then you would, um, for instance, if only one party is holding a half share, then we don't refer to the half share as such, um, uh, or both of them each half share. But when when we get one a half share that's going to be retained by one person, we would start off by citing that person as one half share, and then the yeah. uh, following people would be maybe um, one uh, uh, you know, what one eighth. One eighth, one eighth, one yeah. eighth, making up the other half share, or or even further, say one eighth, one eighth, one six, or, or let's say two sixteenths, and yeah, 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 yeah. on onwards, yeah. Because I was looking at the wills and estates, um, just to refresh myself with regard to, you know, inheritance when when you have a married in community of property, then the spouse. Spouse receives her 50% as usual, and then whatever children come uh, or, or people benefit from the other 50% in terms of the property. Um, and then there was uh, predeceased, and then that uh, you know that then the beneficiaries of the predeceased then inherit, but then it gets split down into you know 50-50 of that portion. Yes. So yes. you know it divides down, and that's that's what I want to check on citation of that because it becomes okay uh, and, and then also when when you deal with the executor is he dealing only with a 50 percent share or is he dealing with a whole will 
Okay, well, it, it depends on what your situation is. Um, here we yeah. know that it is test date, so we are going to follow the actual, um, uh, the, the, the will as, uh, yeah. as it is and its conditions. So yeah. if he's not dealing with the, the 50% and there was massing, then that's a different story. But if it's a, a person that only can deal with his half share and there's no ma mass massing, then it would literally only deal with that half share and then that because of the executor's capacity to deal with only his property uh, falling in mm -hmm. his estate, then only the vesting of that um, in its okay. different shares would be dealt with in the vesting clause. Ah, that okay. Now I understand. Now it makes sense that he's only going to vest what he's dealing with. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. That, yes, so that that's, makes that's, sense. And then, it, but also, sorry. if if for instance, um, it's not an estate. And for instance, you are dealing with um, passing transfer of, let's say, five eighths. Then you would refer to five eighths being the aggregate of uh -huh, the shares. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I have a okay. nice example there. But also, when we are not dealing with a will, then we have to understand when. Um, and, and there's a lot of law relating to this, and you have been dealing with estates, so you have experience in that. But there's certain situations where it doesn't matter what happens, is that wife gets it, gets everything. Yes. Um, and then there's other situations where we have um, the, the child share, and the, but that's only for uh, for the wife and it. children, but what, yeah, for interstate. But also, um, we, we, um, we deal with situations where um, the different uh, wives, if there's more than one wife, are vested yes. in equal shares. And uh, okay. I, I would love to just, um, I, I might not be dealing with estates, but I'm trying to get people to a point where they can draft estates already at this early stage. Yeah, because I, I mean, one of the things that I'm picking up is that there's, you know, some of the work that I did in Johannesburg dealt a lot with estates and yeah. one of the one of the things that i was looking back on was uh where you have a, a portion of the estate that is dealt with uh by the will and a, another portion that is dealt with intestate and that's that's something that i need to understand as well if you know when it affects yes. uh when it the falls land in transfer. the residue yes yes correct um, yeah. I, 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 I've actually been going into that because I did that advanced um, uh, uh, thing with UNISA on estates, yeah. and so that yeah. that has really triggered my um, uh, my fascination with it. Even though I hate estates, it's too much admin. <laughs> <laughs> um, it triggered my um, my wanting to know more about it. So um, there's a heck of a lot of stuff that I want to share on that basis. And that is yeah. supposed to be within the knowledge. I just uh, hope that people take the time to watch out for the updates and, and extra resources. But yeah, I want to touch on that. All right. And I'm, uh, I'm I'd, going I'd, to I'd appreciate that. if we can at least have a, have a look at. And, and and again, just the other thing that we we I would like to try and understand is repudiation. If we if we get to that point as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely repudiation or ideation. Yes. Yeah. That that that's a. It seems to be a fairly common, if I look at the notes that I've got, it seems to be a fairly common question where they Absolutely. talk about massing and aviation and everything. And then, you know, what happens if the the spouse repudiates and then what yes. do you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that is an, an, a, a constant question coming up, I can tell you. And it's so funny because we deal with very few massed estates. Well, but they that, like to ask that. When, when, I, when I did estates... I don't know how long ago it was. They they always used to say massing, massing, and it, it, although it came up as a as a board exam, mm. it, it wasn't it wasn't a killer of an issue because everybody said, "Now nah, you'll never see a master state if you ever go into practice." Yeah. Uh, but they seem to love asking that question I around know. massing. I, 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 just don't I don't understand, understand it. why, because uh, to me as well, it's supposed to prepare the uh, the exams there to have you pass at a basic level, because you're only going to start to learn things once you are executing deeds. So I, I really don't understand why they ask that either. I keep on asking why, because I haven't in 21 years of practice, I haven't seen one master state. And that, that, that's what. That's what the lecturer told me the last time uh, that that you'll never see a mass estate, and, yeah. and yet we seem to deal with massing uh, to the nth degree, and yes. nobody can actually really explain massing. 
Yeah, I must say is um, uh, uh, I was uh, thrown into a, an exam prep uh, class that John Christie was supposed to take, and uh, I actually uh, somebody asked me a question, and I actually said to them, "Give me a moment, I'm going to research it." And I actually researched um, massing with reference to Mayrovich and everything. So it's actually mm -hmm. something that I now completely are able to understand and to explain um, because I had to I had to go and prepare for that uh, because I've never yeah. worked with it and, and I know it's in the questions so I can answer a question basically on that but I never went into the detail of that so it's something that uh, I will send uh, you my re um, my resources for that um, because okay. I still have the email where I answered it okay it was about yeah, four, three four years ago uh, that we did um, but yeah. I did an exam prep and I said, I, I really don't want to do it because I don't like it. But um, yeah, I was yeah. thrown in there. Perfect. Good. Okay. All right. I don't want to keep you. That's my five minutes. To, okay. I've, I've overextended. <laughs> okay. Thanks. No, perfect. And, I'll send and good out night what to everybody. I can. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Um, Arthur Dan Sulamut Dan oh, Danusha. Sorry. Uh, Krisha, William, are you guys? And uh, Angel, you have a question. Anybody has a question? Shimon, no. you've asked good, good questions. I'm Arthur, I'm good, thank you. Are you okay? It was a lot of um, uh, uh, academic work that we did today. Now we're going to put it into practice with regards to those servitudes. No problem. I'll be ready. I'm going to sleep on it tonight. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, sleep on it. <laughs> Put your textbook underneath your pillow. It will climb into your head. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks so much, Marika. Okay, then, guys. <laughs> Keep well and stay safe. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Arthur. Bye -bye, Arthur. It's only a couple of guys left, so um, if there's no questions, then if you're okay with it, we can we can call it a night. Thank you, guys. I'm leaving now.